share uh, an event that uh, I participated in when I was uh, 18, which was not very long ago, as a matter of fact. <laughs> okay, maybe it's been a while. <laughs> at the time, I was uh, a student in, uh, at Ambassador College down in Pasadena, and uh, some friends of mine that I got to know uh, talked me into running the Los Angeles Marathon. And so on March 5th, 1989, I uh, was at the starting line for the Los Angeles Marathon, along with about 19,000 other people. And I had to go back and, and kind of take a look at it, be, and I uh, was kind of surprised that uh, this was actually the only the fourth running of the LA Marathon. So it was still yet in its infancy. And so here we are. Uh, in the morning, and uh, all of us waiting to start, and the, the, uh, the race began. And there are so many people, it took five minutes for me to get to the starting line. So to kind of give you a, a sense. And so the start was down this really long road, and it was really fun to watch because it was like the sea of people, you would see this almost undulation like a wave. Like if you were looking out of the ocean, just up and down with people running. And so this sea of people is there. One of the things that really struck me, because I'd never done any kind of official event ever, although I ran track in high school, uh, I never signed up and participated in any kind of paid running event, a 5K, a 10K, not even a fun run or a walk. So um, I kind of more or less, to say the least, jumped into the deep end of the pool signing up for the LA Marathon. But, you know, the thing that uh, was, was really interesting was that the entire 26.2 mile race route had people along the entire way cheering you on. And so wherever you were, there were people just clapping and applauding. They had mariachi bands out there. They had all kinds of other bands and whatnot going on. You ran through Chinatown and the uh, Hollywood Boulevard and you see the, the Avenue of the Stars. So there was a lot to just kind of keep you going. But for anybody who's ever done a marathon, I know at least one person in this uh, room has done a marathon, and maybe somebody else. There's the infamous mile 20, which is known as the wall. And it's called the wall because it's about this point in the race, you have pretty much tapped all of your energy stores. And so this is the point where you potentially are gonna start cramping up and you just, don't have anything left. So besides the people encouraging me on, there was a scripture that helped me press on from mile 20 on. And I still have six miles to go. Now, I can look around this room and some of you would tell me, look, me just going from here to the coffee maker and back, I'm done. <laughs> and I got to do that six more times? <laughs> we better have oxygen waiting for me. But there was this scripture, and uh, I, I'll just, it's not only going to be on the screen, but it's from 2 Timothy 4 and 7, and it says this, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. That scripture kept pouring through my mind. There was this, Assure, this, this certainty that I was going to finish this race no matter how difficult it was. And it was difficult because for runners that are going to run a, uh, a marathon in particular, you want to run when the weather is cool. And, and 
I've heard the optimal temperature is like 40 something degrees, okay? This particular day, and this is in March, okay? So, you know, LA is fairly similar. It's probably a little bit cooler, you know, temperature wise, but it was 70 degrees. It was a hot day. I didn't know any better. You know, to me, 70 degrees, that's cool. You know, I was from the south, so, you know, 70 degrees, you know, to me was like 50. Uh, it was wonderful. But anyway, kept the faith. And so it's this subject of faith that I, I want to share with you for our message today. So let's move into today's passage for what I want to focus on, which provides us encouragement from the Apostle Paul in this message. And, in, and I've titled this message, Faithful to the End. Just to continue, you know, with what Peter has uh, shared with us today. So we're going to be in 1 Corinthians 1, and uh, we're going to be reading through verses 1 through 9 out of the New International Version. So if you've got your Bible, break it open. If you've got your phone, pull it up. You can always look up there on the screen. So let's read through 1 Corinthians 1 and starting in verse 1. So it says this, Paul, called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and our brother Sothenes, to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people, together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way with all kinds of speech and with all knowledge. God thus confirming our testimony about Christ among you. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will also keep you firm to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, who has called you into fellowship with His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Well, before we get more into those scriptures, let's talk about what's kind of going on as Paul is writing this letter. As we know, this is to the church in Corinth. And Corinth was the capital of the city of, uh, the capital city of Achaia, if I'm pronouncing it. That's in current day Greece. And it was a strategic point for the Romans, and it was because it was a port city, and it was very prosperous city of trade. And so as a result of all this trade and all this wealth coming in and out of it, it was also a city that had a very decadent lifestyle. And through the prompting of the members in Corinth, uh, they had written a letter to Paul sharing with them the issues that they wanted him to respond. So Paul is writing this letter to address a number of issues to the church that they were going through, that they were being tested. So to set the stage there, we're not going to get into those issues today. We're going to focus on these passages. But this letter... Although it's written to the Corinthians, is not just for the believers in Corinth. Okay, when you go back and you look at verse two of this, it says, um, "To the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called His holy people, together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and our Lord." So this is for us as well. All these years removed. And so, I'm going to spend most of the message today kind of going through a section from verses 4 through 9. And we're going to look at this section because starting in verse 4, Paul transitions into this, I think it's just a, a wonderful way, this wonderful thanksgiving to God for what he has done for the believers in Corinth, and, and I will say what he has done for us as well. 
So let's take a, a deeper look at this in a moment. As Paul uses faith to encourage us, to educate us, to remind us and empower us as believers of Jesus. And so when we talk about faith, there's the, there's the passage in Hebrews 11 and 1. It talks about, it really defines faith. And so faith is this, as it's described in Hebrews 1.1. 1, 1. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance for what we do not see. So with that as kind of a, just a framework of the faith that we're going to be looking at and talking about. So what are these wonderful and encouraging things that Paul is going to talk about and give a thanks to the believers of Jesus. That's you and I, right? And it starts in verse 4. And the first thing that he thanks God for is this. He says, God's grace given to you in Jesus. It's this gift. It's, it's this blessing brought to us by Jesus Christ. Grace is not something you can see, you can't touch it, you can't smell it. You have to go on faith that grace has been given from God. Because if you don't have that faith, then you're not, you're not going to believe that Jesus Christ really does cover us, right? Right? What's the second thing that Paul th uh, thanks God for? And we see this in verse 5, a couple of things. And it says in, in verse 5, he says, For in him you have been enriched in every way. I love this word. This word means to be richly furnished. Richly furnished. Or... Uh, to make rich. Um, one of the commentaries says, plentifully and abundantly provided for by Christ. Plentifully and abundantly provided for by Christ. So let's think about some things that we're enriched that are in our lives in, in, in just every way. We are enriched by knowing the good news. Right? Right? We are enriched in living life differently from the way we used to live and the way the world lives. Some of you, you know, that's a test right there, but we are. We're enriched. We're enriched because we have now relationship with God the God of love doesn't get any better than that. But we're also enriched in the relationships that we have with one another. As we live out our life in Christ, in love for one another. So it's safe for Paul to say, we are enriched in every way. When we look in verse 7 we see this other praise of thanksgiving that Paul shares with us. He shares with us, you do not lack any spiritual gift. From one commentary, kind of uh, uh, shared it this way, from Ellicott's commentary for English readers, it says, you have as fully as any others those spiritual gifts which sustain you and enable you to wait for the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Not with fear, not with impatience, but with a calm trustfulness, or I would say faith. Now, we've heard sermons on what is your spiritual gift, okay? Some of you may be wondering, I don't know if I have a gift. You do. Let me share with you some things that are gifts. 
And I hope one of these maybe resonates with you. If it's not, this is not the exhaustive list. But I picked these because I felt like in this body, these are gifts. There's the gift of giving. There's the gift of encouraging. There's the gift of teaching. Serving. Hospitality. And faith is also a gift. So we have gifts. And we do not lack. As the commentary said, you have fully what you need to sustain and enable you to wait for the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we are waiting. Come, Jesus, come, right? We live in a very strange world uh, right now. And so, because of God's Holy Spirit in us, who distributes spiritual gifts to the body of Christ, it allows us to remain unified and faithful. So, here's where we started. We started with kind of this beginning. Our faith began with us believing in Jesus. And grace came to us. Now, let's continue forward in the, the thanks that Paul shares with us. Because in verse 8, there's a couple of things he shares with us. He says, God will also keep you firm to the beginning. No, the end. To the end. I like how the New King James Version shares it. It says who will also confirm you. And, and in some ways, I think of it like this. He says to you, I know you. I confirm you. There's also, to me, there's this sense of being grounded or rooted in faith despite all the distractions Despite all the chaos, despite the suffering, and despite our desires that are present in this world. I confirm you. And then he continues and says in verse 8, You will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. So when he returns. So even in this, there's, there's a faith element that says, hey, Christ is going to return. So there's that. We, we want to acknowledge that. At the same time, you will be blameless. Now, what does this blameless mean? So I would just want to kind of clarify that. That doesn't mean you've been perfect, okay? Because none of us is perfect. Some of us think we are, but we're not, okay? But what he's saying is, is this, it, the meaning is more around there is no accusation against you. No accusation against you from, uh, from one a commentary. And another says that uh, it denotes that those against whom there is no charge of crime. And I like this other one from, uh, this one's from Matthew Poole's commentary. God will accept you as if you had never sinned against him. Now, that doesn't mean we get to go out and just live life how we want to, because that would be us living outside and a separate and apart from God. So I want to be very clear on that, okay? But a life in Christ does look different from the life of the way the world lives. So, you know, you will be blameless. Now, that statement can be difficult one to overcome in our mind for partly of what I've already talked about because we often wrestle with, in our conscience, the wrongs we have done or the struggles that we battle. But God is good. We come before Him and we ask for help. We seek His guidance. We repent. We don't stay in the space of where we were. 
We keep moving forward. Just like when I was running that marathon, I didn't stay at the starting line. The first part was easy. The last part was hard. So, what assurance is there for all these things that Paul has been so thankful God has given? And we find that in verse 9. In verse 9 it says, God is faithful who has called you and me into fellowship with His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. God does not give up on you or me or the body of believers. He doesn't. Now, we may give up on ourselves, right? Like, this is too hard. I can't continue. That's, that's, that's us. That's our human nature. We are weak. And we have to find strength and overcome that through depending on God to get us through this difficult time that maybe we're going through. I'm going to paraphrase. This is in 2 Timothy 2 and 13, but it basically says this. God remains faithful even if we don't. That is uh, just as amazing. So, as we get towards wrapping this up, there's a question that I think we need to spend a little bit of time, and that is, how do we persevere and grow in our faith? So I want to share with you some things. And um, if you've got something to take these down, take them down. If you don't, go back and listen to the YouTube video again, because I think these things are important. So how do we persevere and grow in our faith? And I don't think these are going to be any surprising revelations here, but I think they're worth sharing. The first one is, and this is going to be scripture-based, so you're not going to see these, but that is, hold unswervingly to the hope we profess about Jesus, about who Jesus is and what he did for us. Hold on to that. Hold on to the fact that Jesus came to this earth. He bore our sins, died on the cross, and was resurrected. So he could bring us into eternal life and relationship with God and himself and the Holy Spirit. Hold on to that. And I love the word that's used, unswervingly. Stay straight. Don't get distracted by what's going on over here or over here. Stay focused. The second thing, and this is in a way partly uh, why us getting together is so important. Not just now, but even outside of this. The second thing is that we consider how we can spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Or put another way, encouraging life-changing relationships with Jesus. Okay? The third thing, be in fellowship with one another so that we can encourage one another. Now this one, I really appreciate because... One of the things that's really, um, and I've talked about it a number of times here publicly, is the persecuted church. We're not necessarily a persecuted church by any stretch, right? But I want to share this, and this is in 1 Peter 4, 16, but it says this, and this is something I want us to hold on to. Do not be ashamed of being a Christian. Don't be ashamed. We live, in a, we live in a society that shames Christianity. If you don't know that, it does. Do not be ashamed. We are a light in a dark world. The fifth thing, 
and this is, this is challenging, all right? Commit to do good even when you suffer. When somebody does a wrong against you, stay in the space. Return it with good. Whew. That's tough, right? Because I know that when the button gets pushed for me, it's not, thank you, friend. No, it's not. And the last one is, is this, and this is from Romans 12 and verse 2. It says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And that's a daily thing. Don't let the world change you. Rather, you change the world by how you live by the relationship that you have with one another, by the relationship that you have with God and His Son and through the Holy Spirit. Do not be ashamed. You live a different life from the way the world lives. Proverbs 23 says this in 7. It says, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Think differently. Thank Godly. And then a part of that not conforming to the pattern of the world is this. And this is, you'll find this in Colossians 3, 12. It says, you display or clothe yourself with compassion and kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. And if you want to just sum it all up, Put on love, because that covers it all and binds us together in perfect unity with Jesus. So, back to verse 9. God is faithful who has called you into fellowship with His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And as you remain faithful to God, the more you grow in your love for Him and His faithfulness shown to you. God, beyond a question, is faithful to the end. He has you covered as you follow Him. And so when we get to the end of our physical race, I believe you'll be able to say, as the Apostle Paul said, when he got to the end of his race with confidence, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Amen. Let's pray. God, your word is good. You are good. Thank you for always being faithful to us, Father. In every time and in every situation, Father. Let us rest on that faithfulness, the goodness that you show to us even in difficult times. We thank you for this day. We thank you, for, Father, for bringing us hopefully closer into faithful relationship with you, Father. Let us not only take what we've heard, but let us apply it. Let us be that light that you ask us to be, Father, in the world that we live. Our world so desperately needs to see your love on display. So we thank you. As we leave here, we just want to pray all these things. Let us each be blessed, Father, and renewed and enriched in our faith in you and what you have done and continue to do in our life. We pray this in your son's name, Jesus. Amen. All right. Let's say our benediction together. And it says this. May the love of the Father the tenderness of the Son, and the presence of the Spirit, gladden your heart, bring peace to your soul, this day and all days. Amen.